In this compilation video, I'll be going through articles about Hollywood or Hollywood people in the 1920s, and all of them were originally published in the 1920s. It should be noted that I can't guarantee that everything in the articles is completely factual, but I wanted to present them as they were originally. Hollywood was a place of illusion and facade, and many of the fan magazines often reinforced the image that Hollywood wanted to project. But regardless, the articles are an interesting glimpse into this very important time in the capital of the movie industry. So, without further ado, let's get into it. How a Picture is Made Photoplay October 1923 The first step in the production of a photoplay is the preparation of the scenario, known in the studio as the script. Here is the scenario chief. The casting director engages the players, selecting the types desired from the hundreds of names, addresses, and photographs which he has on file. For the principal characters, the casting director usually interviews players selected by the director himself. The filling of the minor roles is left to his direction. The technical director, usually an architect with the knowledge of period construction, maps out the plans for the sets. He is shown here in consultation with the chief carpenter, who will supervise the actual building of the sets. The art director supervises the details and dressing of the sets. He is generally a man with wide experience in interior decoration. The man in the cap is the assistant director, who has charge of the entire company in matters of transportation, housing, and other arrangements when on location. The lighting of a set is one of the most important details of a production. Here is the lighting expert, instructing one of the electricians in the best way to get an effect. Much experimentation is usually necessary before the proper result is attained. Musicians are used during emotional scenes to put actors into the proper mood and to work up climaxes. Music hath charms, it seems, not only to soothe, but to excite to emotion. Here is Mr. Neelan leading his orchestra and directing a scene. And here is the chief, Marshall Neelan himself, directing a scene. He is the person who knows what all the shooting is for. The shooting squad, ready for work. Two cameramen, an assistant cameraman, and the continuity clerk. The slate held by the assistant bears a different number for each scene, and is photographed at the end of each take to facilitate handling and assembling in the cutting room. The continuity clerk keeps a detailed record of each scene. She knows how the players enter and exit, how they are dressed, and every minor detail. These are important because, when the scene is continued the next day or next week, every detail must correspond. After the film has been developed, it is sent to the drying room. Here it is wound on large skeleton drums, which are revolved until the film is thoroughly dry. It is then wound on smaller reels for convenience in handling, and sent to the film editor, who has it run in the projection room, selecting the best scenes. From the film editor, the film goes to the cutter. He chops up the long strips of celluloid, cutting out the scenes selected by the film editor, pasting them together in their proper order, and inserting the titles. When he has completed his work, the picture is ready to be shown. With the picture ready for the market, it is necessary to tell the public about it. So here is the publicity man, the famous Pete Smith, with dark glasses, cigarette, and everything, seated at his favorite typewriter to inform a palpitating world of picture fans of the wonders they are to see. What Happens to the Story by Hunt Stromberg Picture Play, October 1920 there's a crackling splatter of light across the screen, and you see a giant tree struck by lightning, while the drums in the orchestra rumble, and peas are rattled in a can to simulate rain. Gosh, they can do anything in the movies now, murmurs a man behind you. Must have taken months to catch that. How do they do it? That same remark applies to a lot of other things you see on the screen. How do they catch a storm at sea, in which great liners are shown sweeping up to the crest of a wave and then hurled to watery depths? 
How do they go about making a picture anyway? Where do they begin? It's interesting to watch the progress of a scenario through the studio, just as engrossing as it is to step behind the scenes and see how nature is denaturized, so to speak, and the fury of a storm depicted right on the studio lot. By visiting the Thomas H. Ince studio recently, I learned something about this mysterious journey, and incidentally, about some of the tricks that make picture making what it is. When a story is accepted for production, 12 copies of the continuity, the specially written version of the story in which it is divided into scenes, are made and distributed among the departments concerned in the making of the picture. The heads of these departments and their assistants must become familiar with it and its general requirements. And everybody, regardless of rank or office, is asked to submit ideas and suggestions to the director assigned to the picture. This is one reason why the very best place to learn to write for the screen is from a job inside the studio. The casting director then selects the players who are to surround the star. Sometimes two candidates, possibly three or four, are chosen for every role. Each is tried out, and finally one is selected. Meanwhile, the director and his assistant, the technical and art directors, and the stage manager get together in the office of the production manager to arrange a definite schedule for the construction and placement of all sets for the picture. With this schedule completed, the art director makes and submits to the director rough sketches for these sets. The director must stretch his imagination and make sure that such sets are in strict accordance with the action and atmosphere of the story. Every detail must fit in perfectly with the general feeling of the story. For example, when a recent picture of Enid Bennett's The False Road was in preparation, it was necessary to get sun-baked lumber and, in the studio, build the little cabin around the foothills called for in the story. Wintry scenery and a realistic snowstorm also had to be created. Cotton batting, tinsel, bits of snow white paper, and a special fluid whose formula the studios will not divulge produce the proper effect. Under the head of atmosphere, such details as furniture, decorations, and all the odds and ends of the set are included. For instance, if the heroine of the picture is blonde, it would be criminal to provide a light background. To gain a contrast and ensure crystal clear photography, the walls of the set must be dark. A staff of draftsmen handles those first plans of the art directors, and they are passed on by Mr. Ince, the director, and the continuity writer of the picture before they go to the stage manager and the carpenters. Usually, the building of a set takes from 2 to 30 days. Sometimes, such building takes place on the stage where the set is to be used, but in the case of elaborate sets, miniature models are first made, and the actual building takes place in the mammoth shops adjoining the studio proper. The sets are then moved piecemeal to the stage where they are to be set up, and it's no unusual sight to see husky stagehands stalking about the studio bearing a Greek column or a large portion of a winding stairway to the proper destination. Samson would have found no difficulty in getting a job around the studio, and Hercules could have had a life contract as a mover of scenery if they lived nowadays. Finally, the set is okayed by that court of last resort, which I have already mentioned. Then comes the familiar cry of ready, lights, camera, and actual production begins. Now for the promised revelations regarding ways of outwitting Mother Nature. Of course, it might be possible to have cameramen hang around the woods until a nice big tree was struck by lightning, but several cameramen might grow old and hoary waiting to catch such a scene. And it's much simpler to move a good big tree to the studio lot, wire it with electricity, and then let it be artificially struck in full view of the camera. As for the storm at sea, this too might have been accomplished by using real ships on a real ocean, the ships being insured against loss, and the storm just being waited for until it arrived. But, to build perfect miniature models is much less expensive and far easier, and to make a storm in the studio tank is equally simple. Which all goes to show that, while the makers of the movies will go the limit when necessary, they aren't averse to using commendable thrift and making clever substitutions whenever they can. Masters and Masterpieces of the Screen 1927 A motion picture studio in Hollywood, the screen capital. 
The view is the west coast home of famous players Lasky, and it enables one to guess at least at the tremendous organization and financial power involved in the making of motion pictures. Here are studios, warehouses, administrative buildings, outdoor sets, and locations, a part of what the actual production requires. The sunny weather in Southern California and the variety of scenery and vegetation available have made this the center of picture work. Furniture for Picture Settings Property Department All kinds of rooms in all kinds of buildings must be furnished with the proper articles. Here is just a bit of the space in the property department of the new studios of First National at Burbank. Clothes for all kinds of people. Wardrobe department. All the people who make up the scenes must be properly clothed. Here are outfits for the different social classes, ages, and periods. It is a corner in the huge wardrobe department of First National. Staff working department and plaster shop. Plaster and staff, a mixture of plaster, water, and cement with various other substances, are necessary in making the temporary structures and properties required in photoplay settings. This scene is from the first National Studios at Burbank, California. A room in which films are washed and dyed. The laboratory part of a studio's activities is immense in itself and first-class equipment and skillful employees are both necessary to finish and prepare for use or shipment the precious but perishable film negatives and positives. A corner in a studio's printing room. These six are just a few of the printing machines in the laboratory of one studio on the west coast. By their means, any number of positive films can be printed from the original negatives with a minimum amount of wear. A negative vault in a Hollywood studio. One of 12 such vaults in the famous Players Lasky studio. Together, they hold some 2 million feet of film, all of current productions, safe from fire hazard and where they can be obtained for making new positives. Animating Handmade Pictures As in early experiments, the cast is sometimes manufactured. Masters and Masterpieces of the Screen Animated drawings are a form of moving picture that has several uses. In educational and scientific work, diagrams and other drawings are animated to furnish explanations, as for example in portions of the astronomical picture on the eclipse of the sun. Important news items are also sometimes explained on the screen with the aid of animated drawings. The most common form, however, is the animated cartoon comedy a short film in which all the action was originally drawn, and in which each frame, separate little picture of the original film, was taken separately by the cameraman. When it is remembered that there are 16 frames to one foot of film, or one second of time, in an ordinary moving picture, it will be seen that the studio that prepares one of these small movies has a good bit of work cut out. The studio that puts out Pat Sullivan's Felix the Cat pictures, one each two weeks, states that it requires the labor of 15 people for that time to make one of the little pictures that occupy about 7 minutes time on the screen. Different studios have adopted special devices for holding their drawings in absolutely exact position, and for using cameras and lamps to the best advantage. In general, the method is something like this. The scenario is finished. The artist hands a schedule of scenes to be made to each of the various animators employed. In addition, he gives them sketches of each scene, showing the action started which they are to continue. The sheets on which the sketches are made are punched with two or more holes so that they are held in exactly a certain position by pegs on the drawing board. All the other sheets used, including the celluloid pictures and backgrounds finally photographed, are so punched, and can be fastened in exactly the same position. Each animator carries on the action given him first reading his sequence over carefully to see if he can plan any additional funny business to make it more entertaining. The next sheet following the first will show the action slightly advanced from the first position, say a quarter of an inch if it is supposed to be slow, or half an inch if it is faster. It is necessary that each of them make from 100 to 200 a day. When these are finished, they are handed to a tracer, who traces on transparent celluloid sheets, cells, of the same size as the outline of the drawing. Another tracer follows and fills in the blacks. 
The celluloid is then turned over, and the whole figure is painted in with a grey, opaque watercolor. The celluloid sheet will be photographed over a sheet which carries a background for the picture, and the blocking in of the whole picture with watercolor is necessary to prevent the background from showing through. When finished, these celluloid sheets are sent to the cameraman, together with a chart showing how many exposures are to be made of each. The background to be photographed with the scene is fastened down just as the sheets have been in the drawing. This will remain in place through the scenes where it is used. Then the celluloid sheets are taken, one at a time, fastened down over the background and photographed, each being removed to make place for another. The motion picture camera is suspended at about 3 feet above the picture, and strong Cooper Hewitt vapor lamps, so arranged that the light is concentrated on the picture, are employed. Everything ready, the cameraman presses a foot pedal, automatic and motor operated, and takes one picture. The sheet must be removed, another put in its place, and another picture taken. It takes a long time to complete a movie in this fashion, and the photography occupies a large part of the time. There are many varieties of combinations of animated drawings with other things, as with a regular photographic movie film, such as one sees in the clever Out of the Inkwell pictures, and it is easy to fancy a vast number of uses for them aside from these straight cartoons. Germans are reported as deploring the comparative failure of what they consider the chief film of the season, made by cutting out the figures to be photographed in silhouette, and occupying an artist for years. Of that, we can judge if it is shown here. Lights for the Celluloid Drama Popular Science Monthly, March 1921 The reels in 2,000 feet lengths are placed in automatic motor-driven winders. If anything goes wrong with the film during the winding, the mechanism automatically stops and little damage is done. A dial indicates signals sent to the orchestra, motion picture operator, and electrician by the director. There is also a film speed indicator that the orchestra leader follows to time his music. Such signals as ready, go, stop, spotlight, focus, orchestra, etc. are read. The switchboard operator merely turns the handle of a wheel gradually to reduce or increase the current, causing the lights to grow dim or bright. Fireproof metal cases are used to keep the film in the projection room. Other precautions are taken to prevent a fire. The metal doors and shutters are arranged to close the instant a fire starts. This is the projection room of New York's largest theater, the Capitol. There are four large 2,000 feet projection machines having an indicator like a speedometer that shows the number of feet being run off. For the theatrical part of the performance, various spotlights are used. These are composed of 1,000 watt incandescent lamps and powerful arcs. Colored gelatin filters are placed in front of the light for variety. Have you a dog in your home? Perhaps you may recognize his brother among some of these who live in the film colony. Lots of dogs are shy of cameras, but these shown here with their actress mistresses look as though they are quite used to publicity and as though they rather enjoy having their pictures taken. Picture Play, May 1926. These two little black-faced Scotch Terriers of Anne Cornwall's stagger under the imposing names of Sidlaw Sassanox Wusky and Corinthian Sinful Annie. Not content with one pug-nosed aristocratic peeking ease, Estelle Taylor has three, and a cat besides. B.B. Daniels says that she bought her bull pup, Kenno, because he had such wistful eyes. But Kenno's eyes look here as though they had the true gleam of a fighter. Corinne Griffith couldn't decide which breed she liked best, so she took three. A spunky little Cairn Terrier, a handsome Doberman Pinscher, which is a variety of police dog, and another Terrier. June Marlowe's hairless Mexican has a face that is far from beautiful, but June seems quite proud of it. A perfect demon for speed is Pauline Stark's prize-winning whippet, shown here all set for a race. Pola Negri's little role of fluff, called Teddy, is a very smart fellow, as well as being quite decorative. 
He is playing ball here with his mistress. This is the St. Bernard pup that Colleen Moore brought back from abroad, and he's not nearly as big as he will be. A great companion is Lois Wilson's collie dog, Sandy, and a very pretty person with his white shirt front and his well-marked face. Lillian Rich's wolfish Malamute, who has just produced five wriggling puppies, would have been one of a sledge team if she had stayed in her native north with her brothers and sisters, but in Hollywood, she lives the life of a lady. No masters in these homes, but they have mistresses, and their mistresses are not without wooers. Picture Play, July 1926 There are a small number of lovely homes in Hollywood that know no master's voice. Complete in every other respect, they all lack just that one thing, a man to call king. They are beautifully built, they have rich and luxurious furnishings. They are surrounded by all manner of expensive shrubs and flowers, and they have as mistresses some of the most charming of the star movie actresses, but they have no masters. Many men there are, tis true, who daily cross their thresholds, but only as guests. It would be difficult to count, for instance, the number of suitors for Paula Negri's hand who have spent many lazy hours in and about her stately colonial mansion. Norma Shearer and Marion Davies can both claim their beau, as can the already once married Mae Murray, Florence Vidor, and Irene Rich. But they all carefully refrain from committing themselves to any of these wooers, at least at this writing they are still uncommitted. And so they can step out onto their balconies or onto their front steps or into their gardens and really call themselves monarchs of all they survey. The pictures on these two pages show glimpses of their various dwellings. May Murray's long, low, comfortable-looking home, Louise Fazenda's recently built English Tudor house, Pola Negri's already mentioned colonial mansion, Norma Shearer's shrubbery-surrounded lawn, Florence Vidor's shady side veranda where she serves tea, a corner of Marion Davies' flagstoned patio, and Irene Rich's luxuriant flower garden. Our Stars and Their Gardens Picture Play, June 1926 Mary Philbin is very proud of her roses, for she has cared for them herself. Colleen Moore does not assume the care of her garden, but she enjoys cutting the flowers for the house now and then. Here is Norman Carey, getting a bit of exercise by spelling off the gardener while Marion Nixon, shaded by her big sombrero, tries her hand at tree pruning. You'd never think that Adolf Manju would be interested in gardening, but here he is, to prove the contrary. Marion Davies has one of the loveliest gardens in the colony, and spends much time in it. It is easy to associate Mary Pickford with a love for flowers. A new and lovely rose has been named for her, and is being widely grown. It wouldn't bother Conrad Nagel much if his gardener quit, for he is quite handy with a hoe himself, as this patch of corn shows. Claire Windsor and Bert Littell are shown above enjoying only a few leisurely moments among their flowers, and perhaps that's the best way to enjoy them, if you don't have to do the work. But Noah Beery apparently likes to take a hand now and then in setting out trees on his place. What Happens to Your Movie Money, by Frederick James Smith. Photoplay, March 1927. This is no business for a piker. Don't think because you have $15,000 you can make a picture. $15,000 would last you just long enough to meet Wallace Beery. Today it costs $250,000 to make an average every evening movie. Super pictures run all the way up to four millions. The film audience is the most pampered audience in the world. It pays an average admission price of 35 cents, and expects to see at least a good portion of a million dollars blown in before its very eyes every evening. A stage play can be produced for $10,000. An admission price of five or six dollars can be charged. There is hardly any gamble involved for the producer. 
the spoken theater audience can either take it or leave it alone. Back in 1903, it cost $150 to make a movie, to be exact, to manufacture The Great Train Robbery. It cost $250,000 today for famous players to produce the films starring Richard Dix, Thomas Megan, B.B. Daniels, and its other luminaries. You paid 10 cents to see The Great Train Robbery. If admission prices had kept pace with production costs, you would pay little more than $166 to get inside a screen theater today. The movie ticket cost would be about the same too, in relative comparison with the spoken theater's low overhead and high admission price. There are good reasons why producers can afford to make $250,000 pictures day in and day out. There are more movie theaters, and consequently greater distribution which means more money coming back in rentals. Exhibitors have bigger and better theaters, and can afford to pay higher rentals for bigger and better films. And the foreign market has been developing rapidly since the end of the World War. This has become an important and ever-growing source of revenue. You can remember the first million-dollar film. It was Eric von Stroheim's Foolish Wives. Carl Lemley, head of Universal, had not intended to spend the million, but von Stroheim maneuvered him into the position of celluloid spendthrift. So Lemley put up electric signs announcing the million. Even the Germans are spending money on films today. Metropolis, the UFA feature, cost $2 million. Pretty soon, you will hear of a Scotch studio making big one-reelers. Nowhere but in a movie theater can you get such a marvelous return for your money. The pampered filmgoer sneers at make-believe settings and any sort of sham. He must have the real thing in Saharas, silks, and sapphires. Actually, he gets a Rolls Royce for the price of a scooter every time he goes around to his neighborhood screen theater. Perhaps you have protested because you spend 25 cents at the theater around the corner, or 80 cents downtown. Forget it. Only amazing business organizations make it possible at any price. Hold tight and listen to these figures. There is a total investment in the film business of $1,500,000,000. The capital invested in and around Hollywood alone runs to $1,125,000,000. The annual cost of making photo plays ran to $165,000,000 in 1925. The cost for the present screen year will top $200,000,000. Authorities estimate the average weekly attendance in the 20,233 theaters of the country at 130 million. Assuming that the average admission is 35 cents, the annual paid admission total runs to $2,366,000,000. Back in 1917, in an interview given me for the Dramatic Mirror, an official of the famous Players Lasky Corporation named $20,000 as the average cost of production. He also said that production costs could not advance further. Needless to say, he is no longer with Famous Players. Richard W. Saunders, comptroller of Famous Players Lasky, places the sum of $250,000 as the average cost of all productions of his organization at the present time. This sum was $150,000 two years ago. Big specials run much higher, of course. Mr. Saunders outlined for me some of the details of financing picture-making. The production cost of Old Ironsides ran to more than $2 million, he said. Add to this the cost of exploitation and the carrying charge of 5% upon the money tied up in the investment, along with the other incidentals to the presentation of the film. Old Ironsides will be far into its second year before the initial cost returns to us. Today, big pictures are road-showed for almost the entire first year of their existence. The road-showing of old Ironsides will bring in somewhere between a few hundred thousand and more than a million, dependent upon the extent of its success. Profits in the case of old Ironsides will begin at about the end of the second year. We figure the average so-called program picture to bring back two and a half times its cost and its gross. That means a $250,000 picture should return almost $700,000 in its gross. Naturally, this difference in totals is not by any means entirely profit, or anywhere near that. 
add 25% to the picture's cost for distribution and advertising. There are other items, as the overhead of the home office, taxes, and so on. Until recently, we figured that the average so-called program picture returned the large portion of its earnings in the first 90 days of its release. The major portion of the earnings come in quicker now, because we issue more prints. Only the rare film earns anything after its first year and a half. Even such an extraordinary success as The Miracle Man brings in only a little here and there after the first 18 months. Famous players issue 150 prints of each regular release. 50 more prints go abroad, with titles and cutting adaptable to the country of release. Some years ago, 50 prints was considered a record number for domestic release, Charlie Chaplin being the first star to achieve the 50 mark in prints. Mr. Saunders brings out another reason why a big film corporation can afford to put a quarter of a million into each regular release. While every picture cannot be a success, he said, an organization as large as famous players can eliminate the failure. If a picture turns out badly, it has a big battery of experts to fix the production. The picture becomes a mere incident to the organization where it would break a small concern. In this way, our organization can absorb the lesser picture. Indeed, with a big organization, it is impossible to have a real bloomer. The cost of the super feature has advanced even more rapidly than the average release. The 14 great moneymakers of the screen can easily be listed. The Ten Commandments, The Four Horsemen, and The Birth of a Nation probably lead at about $4,500,000 each. Way Down East is said to have gathered $3,500,000. The earnings of the gold rush are placed at this figure, 1 million coming from Great Britain. Behind these films come The Covered Wagon at $3 million, and such notable pictures as Over the Hill, Robin Hood, The Miracle Man, Scaramouche, The Seahawk, and The Iron Horse. The Big Parade has already grossed more than a million dollars in one New York theater alone. Ben-Hur is due to run a huge international gross. Comparisons are interesting. Cecil B. DeMille spent $1,700,000 in making The Ten Commandments. He is spending more than $2 million in filming The King of Kings. The Calum Company once sent a company to the Holy Land and produced A Life of Christ for $2,500. This film is still playing churches in various parts of America. The Covered Wagon, as directed by James Cruz, cost $700,000. Three years later, Cruz ran over the $2 million mark in making Old Ironsides. Consider the case of D.W. Griffith, maker of more big successes and big failures than any other one screen figure. The Birth of a Nation cost less than $100,000 and has earned over $4 million. Way Down East cost $800,000, 125,000 of which was for the story, and has earned close to $4 million. Intolerance, rated a Griffith failure, cost $700,000. The same film would cost over $2 million today to make. Broken Blossoms cost Griffith $80,000. America, which brought his independent production career temporarily to an end, put Griffith in the hole for $500,000. Samuel Goldwyn recently stated that the winning of Barbara Worth cost him $900,000. At the same time, he pointed out the tremendously advancing cost of filmmaking. When he was the head of Goldwyn Pictures, he produced Carmen for a cost of $20,000, Maria Rosa at $15,000, and Temptation for $18,000. This included everything, among the items being Geraldine Farrar's stellar salary of $20,000 for three pictures. Mr. Goldwyn estimates that Carmen could not be done now for $450,000. Cecil B. DeMille's career has not been completely one of successes, despite the tremendous record of the Ten Commandments. The Whispering Chorus, although it has always been looked upon as an artistic success and possibly DeMille's best picture, lost money, even at a production cost of $100,000.
Joan the Woman, starring Miss Farrar, lost, despite its comparative low cost, $250,000. Over the Hill, made in 1919, cost William Fox just $50,000. It earned $2,500,000. The Iron Horse, made by Mr. Fox five years later, cost $450,000. In making What Price Glory, Mr. Fox had to go away beyond the cost of the big parade, produced by Metro-Goldwyn. You see, the picture business is no place for a piker. Better invest that $15,000 in a chicken farm and lose the money slowly. and a lot of human faith. John McCormick reveals some of the factors that account for Colleen's great success. By P. L. Francis. Exhibitors Herald, January 29th, 1927. I am for and against the third degree. If magazine writers were privileged to use it, I'd have landed the story I sought from John McCormick, First National's 32-year-old production chief, in no time, and could have devoted the remainder of the day to digging up and replacing chunks of turf on the lakeside golf course. Because I did not use the cruder method of obtaining information, I had to spend the entire afternoon studying at first hand America's best box office attraction. I had gone to the studio to get the story of Colleen Moore's rise in four years to the place where her pictures are more profitable to exhibitors than those of any other screen actress. I wanted to find out from the man who produces all her pictures, John McCormick, how he planned the career of this girl so that in the recent poll conducted by the Exhibitors Herald and answered by 2,471 motion picture exhibitors throughout the United States, she was voted the leading box office magnet. I have lived in Hollywood long enough to sense a good human interest story behind each such event, and I approached the office of the producer with high hopes, but McCormick would not talk about his part in it. No one cares about producers, he said with evident sincerity. They are interested in the stars and their pictures. This young man who merely superintends the changing of millions of dollars into scores of pictures is fortified with more years of show business experience than a majority of the industry's veteran producers can boast. He was quoting a paragraph from the showman's manual which says it is poor business to display to the world what actually goes on behind the scenes. Believing McCormick was on the verge of giving me the information I wanted, I guided the conversation, as much as anyone can guide a conversation with this man. The combination of an idea and ideal and a great deal of human faith tells the story, McCormick said. Colleen had been playing chiefly tragic roles when she was signed by First National four years ago, during a search for star material. First National decided the world needed more humor in its screen entertainment, but only through the implicit confidence of a few persons was she given an opportunity to help provide it. Only a few conceded her a chance in comedy, but the majority has now been convinced. The second picture was Flaming Youth. That was the turning point, and she climbed straight to the top. Ever since the first picture, we have held fast to the idea of constructive comedy. Comedy can be side-splitting without being suggestive. It can sparkle without being doubtful. It can make an audience roar with laughter without being questionable. Colleen never has played a suggestive comedy scene. There you are. The idea was comedy, although So Big and Twinkle Toes have proven her skill in dramatic roles. The ideal was the kind of pictures that people would be glad to have their neighbors know they had seen. The faith was the steadfast belief on the part of Richard A. Rowland and other First National executives in Miss Moore's sincerity, and that her devotion to her work would win out. Rules are made to be broken, and out of 14 pictures, this has been done twice, when it was decided to depart from Colleen's type of comedy and permit her to give a fine and sincere interpretation of a dramatic part. The diversion is made also to attract new fans, and we know from hundreds of fan letters that this policy was in these instances fortunate. Then the young producer sent me out to see Miss Moore. A guide led me from the courteously but well-guarded entrance to the lot proper, to stage three. 
this stage seemingly large enough to accommodate a Yale-Harvard football game, crowd and all, this morning housed the Colleen Moore unit, engaged in filming Orchids and Ermine. A few steps from the entrance of the huge enclosed structure brought us into what apparently was the lobby of a big New York hotel. It was like being transported to the Ritz. Gorgeously attired women thronged Peacock Alley, all on dress parade. Guests sat about on lounges and chairs, reading papers, transacting business, gossiping, or waiting for someone. Bellhops shot back and forth, paging people, carrying bags. Picking our way through the throng, we arrived at the lobby switchboard. Presiding there was Colleen Moore, a regulation headpiece over her Dutch bob, and her hands busy shooting plugs into their sockets on the board. We're using a real switchboard because it is too hard to work at a make-believe one convincingly, the star explained. She gave me a genuinely and happy smile, and from that moment, I was on her side. The most fun I've had on this picture has been in getting ready for it, she explained. I worked three weeks on our own studio exchange, and finished with a sort of postgraduate course on the main exchange in Hollywood. You ought to see me when the calls are coming fast. There is something very thorough about Colleen. I believe she derives a great deal of joy out of doing everything as well as she possibly can. She is ever on tiptoes, interested and interesting. In all Hollywood, there is no more beloved performer. She has sincere consideration for the electricians, the camera boys, and the carpenters in her crew. She seems to enjoy encouraging younger players. She cheerfully forgoes her own likes and dislikes to be guided by the production office. She shows eager concern over the way her pictures are received. Is it difficult to put yourself in the place of the switchboard operator? I asked. The hard part is to get away from her, this girl I play in Orchids and Ermine. I live her life, think her thoughts. This girl, Pink Watson, longs for the things she can't have the orchids and ermine. And finally, she gets them. I am happy for her, and sorry for her. Colleen has enough of the self-assertive spirit that goes inevitably with her acting to make you feel she will hold her own in most circumstances. It is an integral part of her nature. It does not detract from sweetness and charm, nor lose her a single particle of sympathy. You don't pity Colleen, even when she is in hard straits in one of her pictures. But you sympathize with her, glory in her determination to win out. Colleen likes comedy. But it's so gosh awful hard, she declared. You may not believe it, but it's a relief to have a part where you may cry and tear up the scenery, as they say. That's why I enjoyed Twinkletoes so much. Poor little Twinks. She was so devoted to her poor old dad, and he was a thief. Colleen was silent. I knew she was thinking of Twinks and her sorry lot. I watched her face. It is strangely transparent when she wants it to be. And you can watch each emotion as it comes and goes. Her face brightened, her eyes widened and sparkled, and her lips parted in a smile than which there is nothing more cheery or soul-warming. Say, she sat up briskly, have you an idea for something funny I can do at this switchboard? All things must end, and it seems that the most enjoyable experiences are briefest. So finally, I had to leave, and when Colleen Moore had smiled goodbye, and I had gone back and shaken hands and farewell with John McCormick, I decided I knew pretty well how she happened to be the exhibitor's choice of the best box office attraction. What Happened to Mary by Jane Dixon Photoplay February 1928 Once there was a little girl with golden hair, blue eyes, and a face that was fashioned for the camera. For the most part, she was a good child. A little selfish, perhaps, slightly willful and not particularly clever. She didn't have to be clever, because she was beautiful, and she had a shrewd mother but she wasn't bad or vicious or mean. 
For a few brief years, she had a most amazing run of luck. She received one of the highest salaries ever paid to a star. By careful publicity, she became the living symbol of innocent, happy girlhood. Her future was so bright that she was hailed as the successor of Mary Pickford herself. Then, at the height of the fairy tale, the clock struck twelve, and as strange a series of misfortunes descended upon Mary Miles Minter as ever befell a human being. And after these calamities, Mary Miles Minter faded away as completely as a discredited myth. First, there was the William Desmond Taylor case, Hollywood's one classic murder. Taylor was found dead in his bungalow with a bullet through his back. In the investigation that followed, love letters, silly and pathetically girlish, were discovered written by Mary on butterfly-crested notepaper. Mary's name became inseparably linked with a particularly sordid and sinister murder. The mystery never has been solved, and stalks about even now, like a restless ghost, to haunt those who were even remotely connected with it. Then, Mary left her mother and brought suit against her for an accounting of the money that the mother, as Mary's guardian, controlled for her. Not a pretty spectacle, a girl suing her mother over money. Even when the case was adjusted by a reconciliation between Mary and her mother, the memory of it hung in the public mind. Other suits followed. Mary was named as the correspondent in a divorce suit. The United States government found that Mary and her mother owed money for income taxes. The movies turned a cold shoulder on Mary. The public heard that the slender child had turned into a plump young woman. Pursued by all the malevolent demons, Mary fled. How and where is Mary Miles Minter living? What becomes of a star when the gleam of it is cut off by clouds that scurry along between the eyes of Earth and its stellar orbit? Perhaps the star goes on gleaming. At any rate, Mary Miles Minter goes on living. First, the place. In an unostentatious hotel in a quiet street just off the fashionable Champs-Élysées in Paris. On the top floor. When I asked a hotel official to be shown to the apartment of Miss Shelby, he denied all knowledge of any such person. I assured him that no longer than an hour before, I had telephoned Miss Shelby and had been invited to visit her. The official shook his head. His suspicion was by no means appeased. He retired through a door, which he closed securely behind him. After fifteen minutes, he returned, summoned an attendant, whispered a long string of instructions, and motioned us toward the elevator. We proceeded upward under escort. In the beginning, I rather resented this escort, who insisted on keeping uncomfortably close to my elbow. Later, I was grateful for his familiarity with the terrain. Never otherwise could I have found my way through the labyrinth of service halls, storerooms, unexpected turns, and blind passages leading to a heavy gray door which gave no indication of what might go on behind it. The attendant knocked on the door a staccato knock of dots and dashes that sounded like a signal. The whole thing struck me as being ludicrously like a scene in a mystery play. The door was opened by a slender, bird-like woman with searching eyes, straight-set lips, and a crown of reddish hair. The woman was Mrs. Charlotte Shelby, Mary Miles Minter's mother. Yes, Mary is living with the mother she once accused of appropriating her salary, and whom she sued for approximately one million dollars of those earnings. Mary and mother are playing a sister act. Love me, love my mother. Love me, love my Mary. God only made one Mary, says Mrs. Shelby. A girl's best bet is her mother, says Mary. Just like the good old days, when Mary was at her crest. There are those who contend that Mary and Mother Shelby are living in a state of armed neutrality. I cannot say. There was no evidence of any hard feelings during my visit. Mary was suffering from the temper of a bulky tooth. Mary's mother was full of solicitation for her daughter. Mary must partake of tea and toast even if she had to dip the toast in the tea. 
Mary must have an orange shawl thrown across her couch, so she would not get the draught from an open window. Mary, Mary, and again, Mary. Some there are who claim remembrance of Mrs. Shelby when, as Mrs. Homer Riley, she was the elocution teacher in the then small but vigorous town of Dallas, Texas. She taught the young folk to speak their pieces for the church festivals and the Christmas charades, it is said. And the pride of her motherhood was baby Juliet Riley, now Mary Miles Minter. When there came a parting of the ways between little Juliet's mother and father, the elocution teacher resumed her maiden name of Shelby, and Juliet Riley became Juliet Shelby. Then Mrs. Shelby took her two little daughters to New York, where, it was believed, she cherished hope of realizing stage ambitions for herself. Her interest, however, centered around little Juliet, who, being a precocious youngster with an unusual doll-like face and winsome manner, soon came into demand for child parts. Juliet's success was so marked that Mrs. Shelby submerged her own ambitions in those of her daughter. Little Juliet became Mary Miles Minter, the two latter names belonging to her grandmother. What a tortuous road the elocution teacher and her daughter have traveled from Dallas, Texas to the secluded, guarded apartment in Paris. And what does Mary look like now? No use denying that the little girl has grown up into quite a husky woman. Not even her most ardent admirers dare claim that she touches on or appertains to the fashionable silhouette. Added weight gives her a mature look, but it is not altogether unbecoming. She gives the impression of being healthy, fond of the flesh pots, but none too happy over their effect on her. The golden curls that once were to rival Mary Pickford's are now bobbed into a chic Parisian headdress. Please, must you say anything about me? Mary pleaded. People are not interested in me anymore. They don't remember me. My name is forgotten. Nonsense, Mary, expostulated her mother. Well then, said the shorn lamb, I am studying. Music, mostly. No, I don't play. Not even a Jew's harp. But I can hear music, and I can love it. I want to make music my friend instead of a mere passing acquaintance. Have you taken up philosophy? I inquired. Philosophy is so modish and psychology, and psychoanalysis, the refuge of the misunderstood. You're getting deep, laughed Mary. I have philosophy only so far as I have lived it. And, she went on, I haven't read a newspaper or a magazine story about myself since 1923. What's the use? One blunder, one mistake, one misfortune, and fame becomes infamy. The climb to public favor is sweet. The fall is swift. The return journey is interminable. Not long ago, I was named as correspondent in a divorce case. A man I had met only in a casual way. When the news reached me, I was in Italy with my mother. Investigation brought out the fact that the wife of the casual acquaintance had selected my name as being the most sensational one on which to base a divorce suit. I wanted to sue the wife who had taken recourse to such unfair methods in order to win her freedom, or whatever it was she hoped to win. My attorney advised me against such procedure. Drop it, he said. Your friends know better. Folks who like to believe such things will believe what they want anyway, no matter how much you exonerate yourself. I took my attorney's advice. One blunder, one mistake, one misfortune the fireworks forever after. And if you had it to do over again, if you were just beginning your career, how would you plan it? Mary smiled. She had taken too many wallops from life to be disturbed by a powder puff. I would not go into the movies. Take that, you youngsters, and you oldsters with young ideas. Not that Mary turns thumbs down on the movies. How can she? But according to her own confession, she has seen 10 movies, aside from those in which she appeared, in her lifetime. Two of the 10 were Chaplin comedies. Moving pictures, confesses Mary, are a wonderful art and a wonderful industry, but not for me. 
I should have remained true to the speaking stage, sighs Mary. I made my first appearance at the age of four. The play was Cameo Kirby, and Nat Goodwin was the star. Perhaps I will return someday, somehow. Who knows? The public just won't let Mary Pickford grow up. Mary changed her type to suit the critics, but the public clamored for their old sweetheart, and the answer is Little Annie Rooney. By James R. Quirk. Photoplay. September 1925. Two months ago, Mary Pickford asked the public, through Photoplay magazine, to assist her in determining on the type of picture she shall make in the future. She had made Dorothy Vernon and Rosita as well as any living actress could do them. The critics raved, but the public sulked. 20,000 letters have been received by Mary since her appeal for suggestions appeared in these pages. We want our Mary back, was the song they sang. And Mary is singing back to them with little Annie Rooney, which I believe is her greatest picture. It has more laughs than the gold rush and more tears than over the hill. Mary Pickford has just passed through a crisis in her career. After years of unwavering triumph and child roles, she heard the inevitable cry of critics urging her to change her type, to put up her curls and play women. The public had not tired of her youthful characterizations. The critics still praised them highly in review. But it appeared that a time had come for a change. Mary regarded the matter as critical, for there is no one less sure of self no one more open to criticism and advice than Mary. Deciding at last to act on the suggestion, she engaged the best directors available, Ernst Lubitsch to direct her in Rosita, and Marshall Nealon for Dorothy Vernon of Haddon Hall. No labor or expense was spared in the matter of production. The result? Two notable pictures in which Mary gave performances equaled by few actresses. Her ability was proved both as an actress and a producer. The pictures were heralded among the best of the year. But somehow, the appeal fell short, far short, of that which Mary had previously exerted. Mary regarded them as failures, and saw in them her own failure. They missed. Some element was lacking. Did the public want to return to the old form of characterization, or was the fault in her interpretation of the new? Distracted and unhappy, Mary at length directed an appeal through Photoplay magazine asking the public to decide. I know the magazine is read by 2,500,000 people every month, she wrote, and that these constitute the essence of picture patronage. So I'm taking this direct route to ask for suggestions as to the type of stories I should do. The appeal for advice brought 20,000 letters from a public representing every continent. The mailmen cried for help, and Mary's secretarial force was doubled. There was no doubt left as to the will of the majority. 99% of the letters beseeched her to be Mary Pickford, to return to the lovable character of youth which she has rendered classic. Mary was overwhelmed with pleasure by the response. It was the greatest testimony of the love the world holds for her that she has ever received. Postcards, words childishly scrawled on toilet paper, letters written on monogrammed notepaper and typewritten on business stationery, they poured in upon her as a tribute of esteem such as few world figures have ever commanded. They made a new woman of Mary, says Doug. Wavering in decision, fearful lest the public was tiring of her, the letters came as an exhilarating tonic to her courage. With enthusiasm, she threw herself decisively into making the best picture of her career, Little Annie Rooney. Never has Mary Pickford played so skillfully upon the heart. When she showed it privately in Hollywood, people declared it funnier than Chaplin's The Gold Rush. But it is not just comedy. It is a creation of exquisite shading, from delicate trembling pathos to sheer hilarious delight. It has the exuberance of youth, and the soul of it, this little Annie Rooney, as great, if not greater, than Tess of the Storm Country and Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Perhaps the art of Mary Pickford has been enriched with new experiences and new endeavor. The radiance has always been hers, and in it lies the secret of Mary Pickford's undying charm. Mary is more than an actress. She's a symbol. 
and through the child which she plays, the quality of her shines clearest. One of the letters she received expresses the world attitude toward Mary Pickford. Most everybody in the world is lonely, it said. It is hard to find friends, and there are many disappointments. But we all go on hoping to find our ideal somewhere, and so that's the reason we come to you, as you are on the screen a beautiful, wonderfully happy child who can make us smile and cry a little just as we used to do as children. Don't ever take that little child away. It would be taking more than entertainment, for we have made her ours, to romp in our hearts forever. For years there has been speculation as to when Mary will retire with her screen immortality and fortune. Mary has no thought of retiring. Her work is almost as necessary to her life as food and air. She is never so happy as when she is hard at it, working on the continuity of her story, deep in production, or the final task of editing and titling. When one picture is completed and on its way to the laboratories for printing, when the ordinary person would take a long vacation free from all worries, Mary's worries begin. She becomes nervous, impatient to be at it again, always with a vision of a better picture, always eager to wrestle with new problems. The only time I ever saw her tired or bored looking was the day after she had approved the final working print on Little Annie Rooney. You are going to take a rest now? I asked. Rest, she said. I'm getting disgusted with loafing already. Do you know a good story? Motion Picture Statistics for 1920 With apologies to Scientific American Photoplay, October 1921 Due to the tremendous progress and growth of the motion picture industry, all information heretofore concerning the films has been too general. It has lacked accuracy and mathematical precision. Therefore, for the benefit of historians and scientists, we present herewith, accompanied by illustrations, all the vital and important facts connected with motion picture production for the year 1920. If all the lorgnettes with which society matrons of the 1920 films haughtily inspected persons to whom they were introduced were amalgamated into two lorgnettes and placed together, they would form an arch sufficiently large to permit the passage of a load of hay. The united force of all the kittenish back kicks given in 1920 by film ingenues when greeting people would be sufficient to heave a bale of hay weighing one and a half tons over the Woolworth building. The combined weight of the metal cigarette cases carried during 1920 by fashionable leading men in the lower right-hand waistcoat pocket would be equal to that of Trinity Church. The total distance covered by chases in the comedy films of 1920 was 247,816 miles, or the approximate distance between the Earth and the Moon. If all the curls of the 1920 screen ingenues were made into a single volute, they would form a hirsute tunnel large enough to engulf a seven-coach passenger train. Comparative pictures showing the marked increase in the amount of hair salve used by cinema actors, male, during the past six years. The figures included Vaseline, pomade, bear grease, gelatine, and all the various unguents for making the hair sleek and glossy. If all the jovial slaps on the back which took place in the gentlemen's clubs of the 1920 society films were concentrated into a single unit of energy, the force of the combustion would be sufficient to fire a 12-pound cannonball from New York to San Francisco. The amount of tears shed in the close-ups of leading ladies during 1920 would be sufficient to extinguish the conflagration of a three-story dwelling. Comparative figures showing the number of 1920 film convicts who were innocent, having been unjustly condemned or preferring to serve time in order to shield another, and the number who were actually guilty of some crime. The number of errors in spelling and grammar appearing in the subtitles of 1920, as compared with the number of errors in the complete works of Ring Lardner. If all the waxed mustaches of society villains in the pictures of 1920 were placed end to end, they would reach from Wall Street to Yonkers, with enough hair left over to stuff eight sofa pillows. If all the heavy black cigars which financiers and plainclothes officers chewed and rolled about in the corners of their mouths to denote willpower and strength of character were merged into one cigar, it would be 554 feet long, or approximately the height of the Washington Monument. 
The amount of energy expended in 1920 by wealthy villains in luring pure and innocent working girls to their luxurious bachelor apartments would be sufficient to hoist the New York Public Library 31 feet from its foundation. The lingering fade-out kisses used as climaxes in the 1920 film dramas would, if fused into one sustained osculation, last 72 years. That is to say, if a couple should begin this composite caress at the age of 6, they would be 78 at the breakaway. The amount of money stolen from private library safes in the screen dramas for 1920, compared with the present national debt of Germany, of England, of France, and of the United States. The relative amount of great artistic triumphs and supreme masterpieces produced by D.W. Griffith, and by Rembrandt, Rubens, Velasquez, Leonardo, and Michelangelo. Block pyramid of the principal ingredients of motion picture plots, showing both the exact and the relative number of times they were used in the photo plays of 1920. Around Our Studio Verse by Maury Riskind Illustrations by John Barber Photoplay, July 1920 The Director Directors, so it seems to me, are just as grand as they can be. They never talk in quiet tones. You see, they all use megaphones. They know what's what. They know who's who. They tell the stars just what to do. And when they talk, the stars are mute. They tell the camera when to shoot. They're fond of laying down the law, and oh, the salaries they draw. I'll say they lead a grand existence. The work is done by their assistance. The star, male of the species. Two hundred perfumed notes a day he gets, I speak of Wally Ray. And though the weather's down to zero, these notes bring warmth unto our hero. He holds the female population completely under subjugation. They love his pictures on the screen, and clip them from this magazine. He's married, happily they say, but still they hope, do Sue and May. Oh, would I had a handsome chin that showed a dimple when I'd grin. The Press Agent A man of superhuman knowledge, with six degrees from every college who knows the stars well, and can speak of them in Latin and in Greek. He tells the world about the stars. Some day he hopes to send to Mars a piece of real important news. Some star has bought herself new shoes. He never, honest hope to die, take this from him, concocts a lie. Yet there are times, I've heard it stated, when he has, well, exaggerated. The Cameraman and now, dear friends, come let us thank the cameraman who turns the crank, who gives us close-ups and whose soul meets unafraid the dual role. If incomplete the picture drama without a city panorama, he hops into an airplane and takes photographs to beat the band. He never boasts, but I, for one, say he's the man behind the gun. And that's a fact there's no disputing, for doesn't he do all the shooting? The Studio Child Though I am young, I work each day. I'm seen in every picture play. My parts, like me, are rather small. Sometimes I grin, sometimes I bawl. I am the heroine, aged three. The leading man at two, that's me. Sex doesn't bother me at all. They say it doesn't when you're small. But though I only have a bit, you bet I make the most of it. Although the plot makes people hoot, they always say my work is cute. The Star, Female of the Species It's terrible to be a star. Some of them only have one car. And where's the woman could take pride in her work with but one car to ride in? Each morning at the stroke of ten, they phone that they'll be late again. They make the studio by two, and work an hour before they're through. So don't you think it's better far to be a sales girl than a star, who gives her life to art for merely a paltry half a million yearly? Props 
His name is never on the screen, which he regards as rather mean. And yet, without his help, I'll bet, the picture would not boast a set. Without his necessary work, alas, Miss Billy could not burk. Without him, Charlie could not ray. Without him, Doris could not may. Unsung, unhonored, and unknown, he may not climb to Screendom's throne. Yet drop no tear upon these pages for him. He draws the union wages. The Ingenue Behold our little Ingenue, with golden hair and eyes of blue. She's pretty, charming, dear, and cute. Or, if you'd rather, she's a beaut. She is the hero's leading lady, is Maud, whose parents named her Sadie. And in the fifth and final reel, their clinches make the heart appeal. Maud seems so young, and yet they say that she was not born yesterday. I looked it up, and it is true. She has a daughter, 22. The Vampire Here's she whose sacrifice to art has left her with a broken heart. Though she is known from Maine to Cal, it's as a downright wicked gal. She may not drop a single tear, but always wears a baneful sneer. She hypnotizes every male, and sends the boob to death or jail. While others know what joy and bliss is, she only draws the people's hisses. Yet would you not draw hisses gaily if you drew ninety dollars daily? Keeping in Condition by Rudolph Valentino The Truth About the Movies by the Stars Contrary to popular opinion, it is just as necessary for the motion picture player to keep in condition as it is for the businessman or the athlete. Perhaps more so, for the camera is very exacting, and to appear before it in poor physical shape is ruinous to the actor. An actor must always look to his personal appearance. It is his stock in trade. And there is no surer way to keep up appearances than by systematic exercise. It need not be strenuous, but it should be thorough and regular. When it is possible, I always make it a point to get in at least two afternoons a week at outdoor exercise. I am particularly fond of horseback riding, and sometimes when I am not working at the studio, I ride every day. When in California, I spend 15 minutes before breakfast each day doing setting up exercises, similar to those used in the army camps. And after that, I take a plunge in my outdoor pool. This puts me in great shape for a hard day's work before the camera. Anyone who doesn't think it is hard work acting before a camera should try just a few days of it. My last picture made greater demands on me than any picture I have ever made. It was not only necessary that I should be in the pink of physical perfection, but also that my fencing should be as near perfect as I could make it, for Beaucaire was the most expert swordsman of his time. To ensure the fact that I should be at my best, I went into an elaborate course of training. Spasmodic exercising does very little good. To get the best results, one should be as regular with his training as with his meals. But exercise alone is not the only thing to help keep one in condition. A man should have mental relaxation as well as exercise. By that, I mean a hobby has a great deal to do with keeping fit. I find I can forget the worries of the studio through my favorite hobbies easier than in any other way. Daily exercise should be a cardinal rule in every man's life. Just a quick note before the article. This movie review is a kind of supplement to part 3 of my Lost Films of the 1920s series from a while ago, which featured the movie Babe Comes Home, starring Babe Ruth. Normally, I wouldn't do this kind of article because it would just be repeating information from another one of my videos, but this one had some information and movie stills that I hadn't seen before I uploaded that Lost Films video, and I think it helps to fill in some gaps. So anyway, let's get into it. Babe Comes Home is a Four Bagger of Fun by Mitchell Rawson Midweek Pictorial, May 26th, 1927 being photographed is no novelty for Babe Ruth. Indeed, he is perhaps the most photographed man in the United States in our time. Posing for the motion picture camera in the role of hero and lover, however, is a rather different matter. 
Years ago, the Bambino appeared in a movie which it happened that the present reviewer failed to see. Different opinions have been expressed as to his work in that picture. At any rate, it is certain that he failed to oust the late Rudolph Valentino from the position which he held about that time as the darling of the cinema public. And now the Babe appears on the screen again, this time in a first national production entitled Babe Comes Home, and no doubt you are thinking the obvious things about it in advance. The Babe can bat as no one else can. Isn't that all that one has a right to expect? Isn't that the essential reason for his being in the movies at all? Unquestionably, that is the essential reason, but it doesn't tell the whole tale. Babe Comes Home is a very amusing comedy picture with an interesting story which begins splendidly, sags just a little in the middle, and then redeems itself handsomely at the end. In fact, like the Babe himself, it comes home with the bang. Well-known players are in the cast. The leading feminine part is enacted by no less celebrated and lovely a lady than Anna Q. Nielsen, and our own humble opinion has always been that a visit to even the least meritorious picture was worthwhile for the sake of seeing Miss Nielsen. Another attraction of Babe Comes Home is Louise Fazenda, and there is also the entertaining Arthur Stone in the role of driver of a laundry wagon. These are the leading lights. These with the Babe. And the Babe is a comedian. Whatever the explanation may be, skillful direction, native histrionic ability on the part of Mr. Ruth or whatever else you like, the fact remains that the home-run celebrity of the ages plays his part remarkably well, as though he had been in the film game for years. The serious moments of the plot find him just as adequate as the humorous. He registers dismay, despair, anger, and so on in a manner calculated to open the eyes of the most skeptical. Of course, the above is not intended to suggest that George Herman Ruth is likely within the next season or two to snatch away the laurels of Charlie and Sid Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, and the other monarchs of movie mirth. Undoubtedly, a large part of the effectiveness of his work in this picture is bound up with the fact that it is Babe Ruth whom one is watching and laughing at. But he really does astonishingly good work. As for the plot of Babe Comes Home, it is based upon a short story by Gerald Beaumont called Said With Soap. Anna Q. Nielsen is seen as Vernie, a laundry girl, who washes Babe Dugan's baseball uniform every week. It is always the dirtiest of the uniforms received from the players. Dust, mud, and tobacco juice appear regularly in appalling quantity to be scrubbed away. At last, Vernie is driven to the point of writing an anonymous note to the Diamond Hero, upbraiding him for his untidy habits. That is the beginning of their romance, which proceeds to a stage where Dugan actually forswears chewing tobacco, and immediately suffers a slump in hitting ability that Bernie begs him to take a plug and be himself. But he is no longer a slave to the habit. All he needs is the knowledge that Vernie loves him, and believes in him, and wants him to win. And, having that knowledge, he is able to step proudly up to the plate, slam the ball to the far outfield, and come home as of yore. The weak part of the picture, as noted above, comes in the middle. There are scenes in an amusement park which are very funny for a while, and then grow tiresome. And there are other scenes showing Babe and Vernie looking over the little house which is to be their home after they are married. This part also needs cutting. Perhaps it will have been shortened by the time you see it. Babe Dugan, the nicotine devotee, regards cuspidors as the chief ornament of a really first-class residence, and has dozens of them scattered about the house. Hence, a violent quarrel with Vernie. Babe Comes Home is not a classic of the screen by any means. It has its weak spots here and there, and they are very weak. But taking it by and large, it is a very entertaining picture indeed, replete with gags that will cause sufficient laughter to do anyone a world of good. Screen Pets The Blue Book of the Screen, 1924 Among the dumb actors of the screen is John Brown, the huge grizzly. He has worked for nearly every film company on the West Coast, and is especially in demand by the comedy companies. In spite of his vicious appearance, John Brown is as harmless as his comedy rival, Rosie the Monk. Rosie's specialty in pictures is teasing the cat and starting trouble in general, and day by day, she is becoming more and more of a slapstick comedienne. The aristocrat of the animal performers is the trick horse, Queenie. 
She dashes to the rescue of a child in a burning house, opens the barn door, and is generally a heroine. She and Brownie appear in comedies together, but Brownie is a star of longer standing and has a real career to tell of. Brownie was born somewhere, no one knows, about five years ago. It was California, for Charles Gee, his present owner and trainer, saved him from the dog pound one rainy January night. He persuaded the driver of the death wagon to allow him to have the dog. This is one reason why Brownie is not known as a thoroughbred. The other reasons are not necessary, for Brownie has won a reputation for himself just as bootblacks and newsboys have attained fame against overwhelming obstacles. He stands four and a half feet high on his hind legs, and weighs about 60 pounds. His body is a beautiful brown, with spots of white here and there. Brownie's first part was in Charles Chaplin's A Dog's Life, and from there he went to Burt Lytell. Bessie Love and other stars followed, until Julius and Abe Stern, officials of Century Comedies, gave Guy a contract for Brownie's services for the following five years. That was three years ago. Every picture that Brownie has made for Century in those years has been a work of unbelievable wonderment. It is impossible to devise anything for Brownie that he cannot do. During a year's production, it was noted that Brownie only repeated one exceptional stunt once. His brilliancy won for him the name Century Wonder Dog. Carl K. Kitchen, an eminent journalist, once wrote an article on Brownie and called him super intelligent. The first comedy Brownie made for Century was Puppy Love, and his first starring vehicle was A Blue Ribbon Mutt. Since then, he has made over 50 two reel comedies. A picture in which Brownie starred is responsible for the first part Baby Peggy ever played. It was called Pals, and a series of baby dog pictures followed. Through her splendid acting in these pictures, Baby Peggy won her stardom. A remarkable asset Brownie possesses is his ability to follow the orders of the spoken voice. It is seldom, if ever, that Brownie needs more than one rehearsal before the grinding of the camera. He follows his trainer's orders to the letter. He is a mixture of bull and fox terrier, and as mentioned before, is just a common dog breed. His recent releases are Tattletale, Rookies, Just Dogs, and Howling Mutts. All are in two reels and feature Brownie only. Who is there among the fans of the screen to whom Max Sennett's canine actor needs an introduction? Teddy, for that is the name this wonderfully clever dog is known by, is a Great Dane. He is not only the best known animal in pictures, but he was the first animal ever to be featured. He is not yet nine years of age, though he has been working before the camera for eight years. Somehow or other, when you know Teddy, you don't class him as just dog. There is something almost uncanny about his intelligence. He knows the meaning of every word uttered in his presence, which is proven by his method of doing things when and how he is told. He does not know a single trick, and his trainer, Joe Simpkins, will not allow him to be taught any. Teddy is about as well-groomed as any other luminary. He has his shampoos, massages, dental treatments at regular intervals, veterinary, and also chiropodist attention. About five years ago, on one of his birthdays, the entire roster of Max Senate employees chipped in and made Teddy a present of a new harness and collar at a cost of several hundred dollars. That he appreciates the gift is shown by the easy and apparently happy manner he assumes when he is photographed in it. What happens to your fan mail? The Blue Book of the Screen, 1924. You wonder, no doubt, what happens to your fan mail, or the fan mail someone you know sends to the famous movie stars. It is an interesting thought, and worthy to be explained. Firstly, none of the movie players reach fame, or start on the road to it, until fan mail begins coming in. This is usually a sure sign that movie fans are beginning to notice their acting, and invariably is a barometer that fame is in the offing. That much for what your letter means to future popularity. 9 out of 10 fan letters ask for a photo of the recipient, and each request is granted. But yet, do you believe each and every letter is read, answered, and sent away by the star personally? If so, the following will advise you differently. 
Unless a star only receives a few letters a week, this would be physically impossible. The star does read the letters, but after that a secretary answers them and attends to everything else which brings the autographed photo and possibly a letter to you. But remember, the star has a personal interest in your letter. He or she reads the letter, signs the photos and letters, which are prepared and mailed by the secretary. You must realize this is necessary, for stars like Valentino, Baby Peggy, Jackie Coogan, Carmel Myers, and countless others receive hundreds of letters each week, and the time alone consumed by carefully going through such a vast number of handwritten letters would take up a good working day doing this only. Therefore, your letters receive the personal attention you desire and feel you receive, while the detail part of it is carefully attended to by a capable assistant in this work. Many hundred envelopes leave the star's desk each day or week, and that's quite a bit, isn't it? The Theater That Was Built For Marion Davies Picture Play Magazine June 1924 when Joseph Urban was commissioned by William Randolph Hearst to reconstruct and decorate the old Park Theatre in Columbus Circle, now the Cosmopolitan, few realized the sentiment and significance of the artist's task. Ten years before, the same theatre had been the scene of his first adventure as a scenic artist in this country, when he was brought from his native Vienna to design the settings for a play that failed, Edward Sheldon's fantastic and poetic Garden of Paradise. Urban's resources were swept away to a large extent by this fiasco, and the war cut him off from revenue from property in Austria. It became necessary for him to establish himself and his art in America. This he did, first with the Boston Opera Company and then in New York with the Metropolitan and the Ziegfeld Follies for a number of seasons. The prominence resulting from this work led to the inclusion of the screen in his endeavors. He was engaged to design settings for cosmopolitan pictures. All the Marion Davies productions have been made beautiful and impressive by reason of Urban's individuality of line and color, but it was not until the cosmopolitan theater was planned that he had the opportunity to express himself as an architect here, although abroad his villas and palaces and public buildings are numerous. Consequently, he brought to this work unusual zest nor did he forget the contrast and conditions brought about by time and money. Now it was carte blanche to go ahead and create the most beautiful and comfortable theater, with no fear of financial setback or collapse. And Urban did produce a theater unlike any other in America, for little old New York. First, he devised a new style of semicircular stage in which the colonial influence is blent with more modern touches of contrast and design. White and gold, of course, carry out the design, heightened by the dull colors on the floral panels painted on black, which form folding doors. Opening, they disclose the screen on which the picture is projected. Four portraits of Marion Davies as Patricia O'Day, painted by Nicol Schottenstein, are displayed in subdued light, and fine old bronzes add to the simple dignity and beauty of the whole. The stage is lighted solely by crystal chandeliers, without the addition of colored illumination or any of the obvious stage effects. It was Urban's intention to create a concert platform against a rich background, rather than the conventional movie stage. Between the ionic columns on either side of the stage are floral panels and soft colors on a black background, similar to the decoration on the folding doors, while the grill below conceals the organ. The walls are elaborately stenciled in a small design of flowers and foliage on a dull gold surface. A striking feature of the theater is the chandelier. The basket-like arrangement of crystal strands is 12 feet in depth and 32 feet in diameter. From it is suspended the main chandelier, mounting 48 lights. Although the whole is said to be the largest chandelier in this country, the effect is surprisingly delicate and graceful. On either side of the theater, on the balcony level, are splendid old Flemish tapestries from the collection of Mr. Hurst. Flanking them are torchères of hand-carved bronze. An interesting detail is the American eagle supporting the base of each. Shields of black glass ornamented with silver tracery form wall brackets for the indirect lighting throughout the theater. 
In reconstructing the theater, Urban removed both balcony and gallery to make way for a single balcony, and installed a projection booth and two private boxes for the use of those interested in the theater. They are of bronze combined with black glass. Now that Yolanda is running there, the stage proper has been made over after the manner of the miracle up at the century. The charming panels are hidden behind the grim gray walls of an ancient feudal chateau, with oddly beautiful lighting to help the illusion. The Kid by Hazel Shelley Motion Picture Classic May 1921 Hamlet, Macbeth, Julius Caesar, Edwin Booth, Howard Thurston, a young Charlie Chaplin, the Barnum and Bailey Circus, a child sliding down the banisters. In other words, Jackie Coogan, prodigious five-year-old, whom the critics called Charlie Chaplin's rival after seeing the kid, and who is, in fact, Chaplin's best friend. When I first glimpsed little Jackie Coogan, he was balancing himself on the balustrade of a studio staircase. The set was for his new picture, Peck's Bad Boy, and director Sam Wood was posing him for some still pictures. Hold the book up, directed Mr. Wood to the tiny velvet-suited Buster Brown-collared youngster. Then he added, That's a good joke you're reading. Smile. Jackie registered the required expression as easily as a veteran. Then, as the camera tingled its final click, he raised his large, deep brown eyes to Mr. Wood, and, with an elfish grin, said, Can you wiggle your ears? I can. Two seconds later, he was lifted down from his lofty perch, and having run around the studio stage several times to rid himself of his natural exuberance, he approached his dad and accosted him with, Come on, let's do the old trick. Then the big of it, Jack Coogan the Elder, and the little of it, Jackie Coogan Jr., did a typical vaudeville jazz jig. Asked by his father to entertain me, he folded his arms and gave me the famous To Be or Not To Be from Hamlet, followed by Robert Service's Madonna and Dan McGrew. The length of the recitations alone would have made this feat marvelous for a child of five, but accompanied by the expression, tone, and gestures which Jackie employed, his accomplishment was just short of miraculous. I think that deep down in the best part of us, every one of us mortals loves little children. Some children more than others. Jackie is the kind that arouses a protective love. In spite of his unusual intelligence and talents, he does not seem independent, know-it-all, nor spoiled. Rather is he appealing and sweet. One feels like taking him in one's arms and caressing him, smoothing his silky baby fine hair, or patting his dainty little hands. Jackie may play precocious child parts on the silver sheet, but not in real life. He is not one of those horrible children who run around sticking pins in animals and grown-ups and hugely enjoying the resultant cry of pain from their victims. But he can enjoy wiggling his ears or real games or even a picture book. By nature, he is utterly sweet. Somehow or other, I like to think that it was this sweetness that struck Charlie Chaplin so poignantly when he first met the little fellow, accompanied by his mother and father in the lobby of the Alexandria. But witnesses declare that the little four-year-old, the meeting occurred a year ago, said, How do you do? Then, totally unimpressed that he was talking to the great Chaplin, said, Give me a quarter. Before Chaplin had handed it to him, I don't want to keep it. I practice the art of leisure domain. Don't you know I am a prestidigitateur? Chaplin was nearly floored, but watched while the youngster palmed the quarter and pretended to find it in his mother's blouse. He applauded the trick heartily, thereby winning the approval of Jackie. Ever since then, Charlie Chaplin has been wooing this baby's favor, and he says that one of the things he likes so much about the boy is the fact that he is more fond of the studio gatekeeper than he is of him, the Chaplin, simply because the gatekeeper has more time to play with Jackie than Charlie has. Then too, little Jackie was the first person he had met in many a long day who was absolutely unconscious of Mr. Chaplin's money, fame, power, and reputation. He met him, as it were, man to man. 
Mr. Chaplin knew that if the child liked him, it wasn't because he was Chaplin, or because he had money, or because of the gifts he could give him. It was because the boy liked him for himself alone, and I feel that little Jackie was the one sweet thing in Chaplin's life during 1920. After that brief impressionistic meeting at the Alexandria Hotel, Chaplin said to his brother Sid, I must have that child for my pictures. So it happened that Sid Chaplin approached the Coogans and asked them to let Jackie join the picture company for $40 a week. Papa Coogan was in vaudeville at the time, and slated to return to New York. Couldn't think of it, he proclaimed. I have no idea of letting Jackie work, and besides, I'm due in New York next week. Sid Chaplin went home to his brother. Did you sign up the boy? asked Charlie. No, said his brother. How much did you offer them? asked Chaplin. Forty dollars. Forty dollars? Man alive, go back and sign up that kid. I must have him, do you hear? Give them whatever they ask. And Sid paid the price and got the child's signature to a contract for one year, and at the same time, the plot for the kid was born in Chaplin's brain. I don't know how much the salary was, but I do know that little Jackie Coogan bought his mother a Packard closed car for Christmas and I haven't the slightest doubt that it was the baby who brought the home and a great many luxuries to the Coogans. Think of being able to buy your mother a Packard at five years of age. What will he do when he is 25? It took Chaplin a year and two months to make the kid, and little Jackie worked with him all that time. Then just before Christmas, the little boy was in an automobile accident and his skull was fractured. For 42 hours, he lay unconscious. Fortunately, he rallied, and with expert care, soon convalesced, as is the way with healthy children. Chaplin sent him a complete indoor golf course to while away the weary hours of getting well, and a pool table for Christmas, and all kinds of other toys and flowers and candies. But of even more curative power were his frequent visits to the little lad, to whom he hurried from New York where he was at the time of the accident. For hours, Mr. Chaplin used to hold Jackie in his lap, and they would talk of odd things, those two. Christian science, tricks, Shakespeare, music. When Jackie became well, he started work as the star of the Peck's Bad Boy series, produced by Irving M. Lesser Productions. And it was during one of those that I met and learned to love little Jackie Coogan, for his sweetness even more than because he is a baby prodigy. Do you know what I want Santa Claus to bring me next Christmas? He asked me, his eyes wide with anticipation. No, I said. I want a motion picture machine. What would you do with it? I asked inanely, busy watching that sweet little mouth and wide intelligent eyes. I'd run off the kid every day. Later, when I started to go, he put his little hand in mine. Goodbye, he said in his quaint old-fashioned way. I hope you'll come and visit my studio again someday. Motion Pictures and the Radio by Olga Prinslau The Truth About the Movies by the Stars Motion Pictures and the Radio must coordinate. It is logical that they should, for the one is sight unheard and the other sound unseen. Each is an art in itself, and yet, like all of the great arts, one can help the other. There was a time when the belief among the studios was that radio would injure motion pictures, but this time is past. They are now working together for the greatest good, as is proven by the fact that most of the great artists are lending their talents to broadcasting. The value of radio to the motion picture industry is easily understandable if one knows the numerous fields reached by the broadcasting stations. One of the best known directors in Hollywood said, While ability is absolutely necessary in the cast of a picture, it is publicity which puts the picture over. Proof of this is seen in the enormous amount of money spent in familiarizing the public with the picture both before and after it is released. Now stop to think that each evening, when the broadcasting stations in this country go on the air, every word spoken is heard by more than 25 million persons, and this number of listeners in is growing by leaps and bounds. What would it cost in dollars and time to get the name of a picture or an artist to this many people by any other means than radio? 
you may answer the above by saying, that may be true for the producer or the artist, but how about the exhibitor? Does he not lose out through the public staying away from the picture house to listen to the radios? The answer is, not if the motion picture industry will cooperate with radio, for the public will be all the more anxious to see the picture of the artist whose voice they have heard over the air. To prove that the statement in the last paragraph is not mere supposition or theory, let us quote a specific instance. Just one year ago, the Los Angeles Times broadcasting station, known as Radio KHJ, put on a program known as the Sandman's Hour. This 45-minute program has been broadcast from this station every Tuesday evening since that time, and the theme of the Sandman's Hour revolves around little Queen Titania of Fairyland, who comes to Earth for this period to talk to mortals. Such interest was aroused through the program broadcasted by this six-year-old that she has become known all over the country as the mystery child of radio. Letters are constantly pouring in, expressing the enjoyment which Queen Titania is bringing to the world. Over 10,000 letters are now on file, with each day bringing more and more. These letters are from all over the world, such places as Hawaii, Philippines, Samoa, New Zealand, Australia, and in fact, practically every civilized country has been heard from. Not long ago, Ivan Khan completed a picture entitled Saturday. The company making this picture had a cast composed entirely of children, headed by Radioland's beloved Queen Titania. This picture was previewed at one of the Hollywood theaters. Did the public say, we will not go see the picture, we will stay home and listen to the radio? They did not. One hour before the doors opened, the street in front of the playhouse was jammed with people. When the house had been filled to capacity for the first show, there were enough people still in line to fill it again, and they waited. After the second capacity house had been filled, there were still about 600 people who were turned away, and the management asked if they might run the picture again the following day. This is just one instance of why motion pictures and radio should cooperate. If more proof is required, just ask Monty Blue why he is the guest announcer at one of the Los Angeles broadcasting stations, very frequently. Mildred Gloria Gives a Party Photoplay, August 1926 a stunning reception was tendered to the members of Hollywood's very youngest set upon Mildred Gloria Lloyd's second birthday. The Harold Lloyd Mansion was turned over to them for the afternoon, and the backyard was decorated appropriately for a garden party, where the guests were anywhere from five weeks up. A beautiful table was laid under the trees and sand piles. Teeters, slides, toy automobiles, and tricycles of every model were there in profusion. Little Miss Lloyd wore a delicately embroidered frock of white organdy and a shoulder corsage of pink rosebuds and lilies of the valley. All the guests voted that they had the time of their lives, and after the reception, milk bottles simply covered the place. A meeting of two leaders of our FFFs, first film families. In other words, just two lucky babies. Mildred Gloria Lloyd and Jimmy Kirkwood, son of Lila Lee and James Kirkwood. Mildred Gloria Lloyd had these guests for her second birthday party. Standing, Bill Newmeyer, Henry King Jr., Joan Williams, Joy Brock, Edna Rosenthal, Gaylord Lloyd with hand to face, Mary Hay Barthelmess on tricycle, Margaret Roach, James Kirkwood Jr., Loria Van Elts, Seated, Leatrice Joy, Mildred Cornman, Mildred Gloria herself, Elaine St. John's, Kneeling. Comedy Development by Harold Lloyd The Truth About the Movies by the Stars, 1924 Comedy development, unquestionably, has been one of the outstanding features in the progress of the motion picture during the past few years. What the next couple of years holds for the comedy is virtually impossible to foretell. 
We do look for a continued development along the line of story, however, which probably will be the main boulevard of advance for this particular branch of production activity. It has been our observation that in any audience, there are a certain number of persons who will demand the slapstick type of comedy. There will always be a great number of devotees to this element of fun making. But audiences undoubtedly are appreciating more than ever the comedy which has a fairly well-defined plot, with action that is not as rough as the old slapstick, and still not too genteel, which is about the best way I know to express it. As for our own plans, it is our intention to mix up the type of offering we will present. That has been our policy in the past, and it has worked out highly satisfactorily. To develop a certain type of comedy and to stick to that without ever changing the variety is to invite trouble in production. For no matter how great the appeal of a player, he cannot go on forever giving his public the same kind of picture, release after release. There must be suspense, or perhaps anticipation is a better expression, in comedy as well as in the drama. We have noted, however, that audiences are drawing closer to an appreciation of comedy wherein the gags are mingled with story than in just straight gag comedies, pictures built entirely for laughs. Natural gags, laughs that are obtained in legitimate situations and by legitimate means, are always more appreciated by audiences than are incidents thrown in purely for a laugh. Not that the audience will not laugh at a forced situation, but you obtain a more wholesome and frequently a more sustained laugh through the natural gag in a legitimate situation. Exhibitors Herald, December 24th, 1927 Those Christmas bells are tinkling a merry tune of gifts and happiness to Mary Bryan, Paramount Star. She couldn't wait until morning. Will he arrive or won't he? Faye Webb of MGM is waiting for Kringle's descent to the hearth. And she forgot her stocking, think of that. And when Master Clarence Kenyon Sills sees this, his first Christmas tree. Doris Kenyon and her husband, Milton Sills, first national players, are just as happy as he'll be. What a blessed Yule for them. Yuletide is nature's best eraser of sorrowful memories. Margaret Livingston of Fox cares for four children of a departed sister, and has provided good cheer and abundance for them. Let's see, what did the young fellow at this house order? Ethlyn Clare of Universal gets out her notebook. It's a good thing the YFATH isn't peeking at the bundle, or she'd have to leave them all here. Clara Bow, at the end of 1927, illustrates how she hopes to break through to further stardom for Paramount in 1928. Not much left of December, literally or figuratively. Estelle Bradley of Educational hangs hers to a lamppost. Louise Fazenda, Warners, an animated Yule card. Well, Kringle leaves a string of pearls for Jeanette Loff of Pathé. There was room for more, but she's joyful. Virginia Lee Corbin of First National has placed all the gifts under the tree, and now is giving it that last happy touch. And when the youngsters see those dolls, they won't even be interested in the other packages. Lois Moran of Fox beats Santa Claus to it. Tom Tyler of FBO rides the hobby horse himself. Christmas toys are a splendid thing for children, and for their dads especially. Will Johnny Mac Brown of MGM be the mistletoe Santa? Gwen Lee apparently is wistfully hopeful that he will be. Will wager he agrees that mistletoe is a good invention, and so does Miss Lee too. Mac Sennett funsters do a Pathé Santa Claus sequence a bit early because of the December closing of the studio. These are Billy Bevan, Carol Lombard, Left, and Ruth Hyatt. Santa Billy fell into the trap. The wreath becomes only a frame for beauty when Alice White of First National dons it. Ralph Ince and Hola Mendez in FBO's Chicago After Midnight arrange a Merry Christmas. The story is of a gangster arrested on Christmas Eve. Josephine Dunn of Paramount still is waiting for Santa Claus but it appears, from the stocking, that he already has been there. 
The last year has brought a number of joys to June Collier, debutante daughter of a New York attorney, who turned her eyes to the studios and is now a featured player for Fox Films. It's truly a real Christmas for her. Renee Adderay of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer considers it the first duty of Christmas, according to tradition, to hang the mistletoe. It's powerfully close to being above her head, and indeed, what could be a better place for it? The Modern Trend in Interior Decoration Photoplay, June 1928 Enter Skyscraper Furniture. Here is the ultra-modernistic twin bed, as lovely Florence Vidor utilizes it in her new picture, The Magnificent Flirt. The beds are in the newest motif of curves and angles. They are built upon a dais, a built-in feature. The canopy of gold cloth is draped flatly to the slate-gray walls. The twin beds are covered with severely plain satin spreads of deep magenta, bound in black velvet. Low tables, chairs, and harmonious cushions are scattered about the spacious, uncarpeted room. Like it? What would Grandma have said about this boudoir? Grandma loved her cozy corners, but this is something else again. This galaxy of color and exotic line would never pass for a boudoir of a decade ago. But, as Miss Vidor points out, the ultra-modernistic boudoir offers the imagination little restraint, and maybe is more interesting than its predecessors. The walls and carpeting are turquoise green. A fur robe covers one of the low couches. Mauve, vermilion, green, and blue are included in the variegated color scheme. The 1928 Bath The ultra-modern idea is to conceal the plumbing beneath floors of marble and walls of foaming sea blue. A cylindrical black lacquer dressing table and a geometrical perfume stand bring the boudoir to the very edge of the sunken Roman bath, hidden by sliding floor. Miss Vidor is an enthusiastic follower of the new curve angle trend that is creeping into the up to the minute home. Father is going to protest, especially when he has to get his soap out of a high vase, such as the one behind Miss Vidor. More furniture in the ultra modernistic mood. You will see this in Miss Vidor's The Magnificent Flirt. Here you have the new trend in interiors. Note the background a green of gold with black leaf motif. Low table of black, lamp of yellow, green, and blue, chair of flame red, floor painted black, highly polished. Miss Vidor's gown of white satin, without adornment, is in the new manner too. Fashion in feminine apparel, says Hollywood, is to follow that of interiors, discarding all that is useless and uninteresting. Life Inside the Goldwyn Gate Photoplay, July 1922 A photoplay pass permits you to enter the magic land of the cameras at Culver City, California, where you will get a glimpse of the fascinating world of films. Here are a few close-ups to convince you that a studio is more than just a factory where they make pictures, that the players are really regular folks. Four little Goldwyn girls, doing their daily morning parade from the wardrobe department to the stages. They carry their costumes in their arms, what part of them they are not wearing. You may read from left to right, Winter Blossom, Helen Ferguson, Colleen Moore, and Jacqueline Logan. It's a hot day, so Helene Chadwick orders just plain sody. This fountain is patronized probably by more celebrities than any other in the world. Goldwyn's is considered the most complete and modern film plant on the coast, and often entertains visiting celebrities. Rupert Hughes, the author-director, is escorting the internationally noted sculptress and writer Claire Sheridan on a tour of the lot. Through this imposing entrance gate to the Goldwyn Studios pass everyday eager aspirants, established stars, extras, character actors. Certainly no girl would want a more charming boudoir. Jacqueline Logan gives Mr. McIntyre something to think about when she insists that her salary be so much for each finger of her hand. It is McIntyre who selects the players for parts and Goldwyn pictures. Every comfort and convenience is provided by Goldwyn for its studio employees. Here, a nurse is rendering first aid in the hospital on the lot to an actor who has met with an accident. 
The Goldwyn Studio is such a nice place to work that the players almost hate to go home. Molly Malone and Helene Chadwick have finished, but they want to examine this motorcycle. When the front porch became a location. Photoplay, December 1920. It became a location in August, before the grass had all been trampled out of Senator Harding's lawn, before the Marion police, both of them, had succumbed to nervous prostration, and even before very many people had found the front porch. The movies were on the job with the Republican candidate for President of the United States as early as the newspapers, and they sent their representative contingent to greet him in his home, even before any formal newspaper call, other than the visits of the regular reporters. It was to be a combined pilgrimage from stage and picturedom, but when it left New York City late in an August afternoon in three special cars, the screen folks outnumbered the stage stars two to one. Prominent in the gathering were Miss Texas Guinan, who had just returned from two years of wild western picture making, Eugene O'Brien, who went along to give Marion a look at a real live romantic actor, Miss Ruby de Raymer, Lou Cody, treating the sedate state of Ohio to some male vamping, and Miss Zena Keefe. Notable in the representation from the speaking stage were comedian Al Jolson, Leo Carrillo, of Lombardi Limited fame, and Miss Blanche Ring. After the crowd had detrained, and had been led to the door of greatness by an especially brazen and enthusiastic band, Senator Harding gave them the porch and the parlor, and Mrs. Harding, equally hospitable and enthusiastic, proffered all the house. They simply told Harding that they and all their fellows were with him, and then they turned right around and came right home again. They seemed to be for Harding and Coolidge, Henry Dixie holding the flag, Leo Carrillo just in front of him, you can't miss Ruby de Raymer. On the right, Lou Cody and Eugene O'Brien. Senator Harding speaking to the delegation of stage and picture stars. On the left is Miss Texas Guinan, and the chap in the center who's taking it all in is Al Jolson. Slanguage of the Studios Words do not always mean what they sound like before the Hollywood cliques. Photoplay, August 1927. Shake em, said the juicer to Ann and Bob one night, but Bobby didn't know he meant intermission for the light. Just mask that light, Sir Philip said. Tis plain that is your duty. Neil Burns is full of helpfulness, Miss Marion of beauty. A number, called the cameraman, to mark the scene securely. Miss Marion's will help the cutter, but Neil's is wrong, oh surely. Light that bank is often heard on movie sets and stages. While Anne is doing it just right, be Vernon's fit for cages. More spaghetti, said Bill Perry to Anne when he craved cable. Bobby Vernon did his best, the best that he was able. Bill the baby was the order which fell on waiting ears. Anne Christie doused the baby spot. Bob's eyes were filled with tears. Hit him, was the cry from Perry, craving bright illumination. While Anne is bidding his command, Bobby thinks of ruination. Save him, said the chief electrician, who thought his aides quite nifty. Anne Christie promptly doused the arcs, while Bobby got real thrifty. Romantic Estate, now Griffith's Studio. Photoplay, May 1920. The most romantic thing we can think to tell you about the old house and rambling grounds revealed here is that one day last fall, when the house was boarded up as it had been for years, and everything seemed unusually deserted, a very thin, very drawn-looking old man in a shining limousine drove through the gates, got out, walked slowly about, almost wistfully as though searching for some vestige of his younger, more vigorous days, and then drove away. The visitor was John D. Rockefeller. He had come to see the estate where he used oftentimes to be a guest. The halls and grounds of the estate at Orienta Point, Memoronic, Long Island, which is rapidly being made into David Wark Griffith's new eastern workshop, was one time the summer home of Henry M. Flagler, Rockefeller's lifelong friend and business associate. 
Part of the house was built in 1882 at a cost of $230,000, tremendous for those days, for his first wife, who died before it was completed. He married again, but the second Mrs. Flagler was adjudged mentally incompetent. For his third wife, Mr. Flagler had an $80,000 wing added to the original house. Under the Griffith regime, the rooms which once were gay with fashionable house parties will be stripped of their grandeur and used as administrative offices, wardrobe and dressing rooms, and lounges for players. The studio itself is built behind and attached to the house. This old clock over the fireplace in the front hall could sure tell some tales, says William Cohen, caretaker for Henry M. Flagler for 29 years and now with Griffith. The deadline for strangers in Flagler's day was the lodge gate. Today, the deadline is the telephone girl in the front hall of the house. What would be a $310,000 summer home without its old oaken bucket? The rest of the house is on the other side of the tower. This is only a wing, built for the third Mrs. Flagler and her maids. It increased the total room capacity of the house to 47. This house was built too long ago for electricity, Mr. Flagler spent thousands of dollars on glittering gas candelabras and quaint wall lamps. This table, valued at $2,000, used to figure in Standard Oil Company directors' meetings, as it does now in a coming picture of Dorothy Gish. Can you imagine anything less than a duchess feeling at home coming down this grand staircase? The house was built around it, and the great hall extends clear to the roof. What Price Organists? A Commentary on the So-Called Jazz Fakir By Lou White, Chief Organist, Roxy Theater Exhibitors Herald, February 18, 1928 A crisis is fast approaching with regards to the position of the great majority of the motion picture theater organists in this country, and out of this situation arises one all-important question. Will the future organist be a jazz fakir or a versatile musician worthy of the name? For several reasons, I am inclined to think that it is only a matter of time before the former class will find themselves hopelessly in the discard, and be forced, if they wish to retain their positions, to remedy the faults which, at present, are excluding them from the class of organists who may justly style themselves artists. Up to the present, the average exhibitor has been forced to take whatever men might be available in his particular section. Many of these organists are men who are devoid of artistic conscientiousness, with the result that neither the exhibitors nor their audiences have received a fair deal from the musicians of this type. Audiences, likewise, have been heretofore rather uncritical of the organist's ability, but it now appears that this situation is doomed to disappear. For this, the radio is, in no small measure, responsible, for it has enabled people residing in even the most remote communities to hear the performances of the world's greatest artists in every field, and in consequence has given them a standard by which to judge the work of their local musicians. The result is obvious. The exhibitor who is employing an organist of inferior caliber will soon find his attendance dropping off in alarming fashion, for his patrons will refuse to come to his theater to see an otherwise enjoyable picture murdered by the inefficiency of an incompetent organist, when at no expense whatsoever they may remain at home and listen to a world-famed artist broadcasting over the radio. There is, however, the other side of the picture, which must not be ignored. It is an undeniable fact that a high-class and versatile organist is a box office attraction. But this last group of men who are good showmen, who have studied organ foundation, and can play with a true and faultless sense of color and rhythm. It is men of this sort who are able, by their own ability and personality, to fill a house, and whose performances are a credit both to themselves and to the exhibitors. In this connection, it seems appropriate to consider just what part slides should occupy in the organist's repertoire. Slides have been a great aid toward enabling some organists to keep up their bluff. I am not prejudiced against slides. In fact, some of my best effects have been gained through their use. 
The music publishers have given the organist splendid material in this field, and a good set of comedy slides or a version of a popular song asking the audience to join in always draws a large applause, but audiences must eventually tire of shouting their heads off to the accompaniment of the latest Broadway song hit. The greatest drawback to the use of slides, however, is that the organist who uses them is building his reputation and his success around the slides he is employing, rather than around his own ability and personality. When a slide is flashed upon the screen, the attention of the audience is attracted primarily to that slide, and it is an impression of the slide and its appeal to them, rather than an impression of the organist's talent and ability which they carry away from the theater with them. When the organist is playing a solo in the spotlight, however, the audience's entire and undivided attention is directed toward him, and his success or his failure rests purely and simply upon his own ability to give them entertainment of a high order. But the power to give a performance of this type is gained only after prolonged and intensive study with men who are skilled in meeting the requirements of the modern motion picture theater but I feel sure that it is only a matter of time before organists the country over will realize that this advanced training is a necessity, and will do everything in their power to get it. For the reasons which I have set forth above, I feel that the days of the organ fakir are numbered, and that the demands of audience and exhibitor alike are going to make it imperative that the organist must educate himself to meet their standards, while those who refuse to do this will soon find themselves hopelessly outclassed, and forever relegated to positions of minor importance. How the Battle Scenes Were Filmed for the Big Parade by A. L. Woolridge Picture Play Magazine, March 1926 Travelers in the vicinity of Fort Sam Houston, Texas, may be amazed to find themselves tramping over what appears to be another no-man's land. Shell holes, trenches, dugouts, ruined huts, withered forests ground gashed and torn by powder, bits of shrapnel, of steel-jacketed hand grenades, of shells that belched from 12-inch guns, and of bombs that left in their wake a pall of pale green smoke. The Trail of Carnage. It sounds repulsive, but if any old-timer is present, the amazement of the travelers probably will turn to a chuckle or a broad-faced grin when they are informed that here were filmed the battle scenes of the Big Parade, the best bet of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer for 1925. Metro used more than 10,000 regular army troops in filming this picture. It had a train of trucks numbering about 400. It employed the 9th Infantry, the 2nd Engineers, the 12th Field Artillery, the 15th Field Artillery, the 2nd Division Support Trains, the 2nd Signal Corps, a Headquarters and Military Medical Unit, and ambulances, motorcycles, and other equipment in regular use by the United States Army. There was no gang of rookies there to enact the battle episodes. Virtually all the troops appearing in these scenes had been overseas, and all were trained in army tactics. The detail was under the personal direction of General Malone, commander, with Colonel H.G. Bishop of the 15th Infantry in actual command. King Vidor, who directed the making of the picture, turned everything over to the army officers when the troops went into action, and was not even near Fort Sam Houston when the conflict raged. The picture probably will be one of the greatest exemplifications of what really took place on Flanders Fields. The actual filming of the battle scenes required nearly 10 hours. Beneath the full glare of a Texas sun, Colonel Bishop stationed himself along the main battery of cameras on a high hill just outside of the fort. The command, Forward March, was transmitted to all officers and men by means of a red flag displayed at the camera stand. Ordinarily, in battle, orders are transmitted by telephone or by signals from a safe distance. But for dramatic purposes, Colonel Bishop was close in, where a sharpshooter could easily have picked him off. But he was where he could get concerted action quickly, and what a holocaust he arranged in a time of peace, in Texas. 
12 inch guns, 6 inch guns, and machine guns, belching an invitation to death. Signal Corps, Medical Corps, and Engineers in Rhythmical Action. Supply trains, ambulances, and motor trucks moving hurriedly forward. Smoke bombs, whining shells, and exploding mines sending forth clouds of swirling smoke. Crater holes torn into the surface of the earth, into which eventually crept the wriggling forms of men. Airplanes, flocks and flocks of airplanes winging their way high above the battlefield, and sometimes swooping low to drop death-dealing bombs. Rifles spitting fire, Big Bertha's booming. And through it all, the steady advance of men and guns into what appeared to be the jaws of death. To make realistic the effect of bursting shells, professional powder men planted mines which, as they exploded, sent showers of dirt upon the soldiers. The big guns seen in action had been used on the German front in France. The 400 trucks which hauled the human targets to the film trenches had also done their part in the real war. Some were battle-scarred, some had been pierced by bullets. Some had not been in use since their motors were killed, over there. The ambulances, too, were veterans of the war. The buildings raked by shell fire and blown up, as seen in the picture, were constructed on the metro lot in Culver City, where materials were more readily available. There, too, the comedy scenes were made, and some of the shell hole close-ups. Only the fearfully realistic battle was filmed in Texas. Of course, all the tricks of the trade were employed to safeguard the soldiers from injury during the mimic battle. The shells from the big guns were not murderous, and the mines were exploded when no man was over them, or near enough to be hurt. The Secret of Way Down East how the ice scenes in Way Down East were made has puzzled thousands of people ever since the film was first shown. These pictures help to clear up the mystery. By Charles Carter. Picture Play Magazine. August 1921. The relentless force of the swelling river that splinters the great ice cakes and carries the helpless form of Anna Moore downstream toward crashing falls holds the great audiences at Way Down East spellbound. A flash of torrential falls is shown, then a close-up of Lillian Gish as Anna Moore lying on a cracking cake of ice, being whirled by the current toward the falls. And everyone wonders how and where Griffith, the wizard of the movies, accomplished this scene. It couldn't be done, engineers and marine experts familiar with the force of waterfalls proclaimed, but there it is on the screen, so intense, so real, that even Lillian Gish and Dick Barthelmess watch the scene with breathless interest every time they see it. The pictures on this page tell the story of the engineering feat that made the famous ice scenes possible. Not at the crest of the gigantic falls shown in the pictures taken from a distance, but at the edge of this low dam, the most thrilling scenes were staged. This structure, which enabled the cameramen to get close-ups, was built at White River Junction, Vermont, on the Connecticut River. But all of the ice scenes were not taken there. As the ice became too broken in one river to permit getting effective scenes there, the company moved on to a new location. Lillian Gish once remarked that all during the winter while Way Down East was being filmed, Mr. Griffith was never happy when he saw a cake of ice in a river until I was on it. The making of these scenes entailed tremendous care, expense, danger. These pictures bear mute testimony to the ingenuity and skill that made possible the most thrilling scenes yet screened. How did Griffith do it? Picture Play Magazine, December 1920. Crashing, crumpling, struggling like fighting beasts as they hurtled into each other, the great cakes of ice swept on toward the falls. The ice jam had broken. And on one of the cakes, as yet barely caught in the swirl, lay an unconscious girl, her yellow hair trailing in the icy water. Far behind, a frantic boy fought his way toward her. 
That was the situation that brought a big New York audience to its feet on the opening night of Way Down East, cheering madly as Dick Barthelmus caught Lillian Gish up in his arms and carried her to safety. Then the audience settled back, a bit ashamed of its own emotion, and said, Right on the edge of the falls, weren't they? Oh, but they couldn't have been. It would be too dangerous. But, well, how do you suppose Griffith managed it? Here's a glimpse of how he did it, and the place where that thrilling bit of action was staged. Last January, at White River Junction, Vermont, Griffith found the Connecticut River behaving just as he wanted it to for pictorial purposes. He looked the ground over carefully, venturing almost to the edge of the falls. And then, well, you'll have to see the picture if you want to know any more about it. Where Way Down East was filmed. Picture Play Magazine, June 1921. A cameraman flying high above the Griffith studio at Mamaroneck not long ago snapped this picture of the 29-acre estate where Mr. Griffith lives and works. The principal points of interest are as follows. 1. The old Flagler Mansion, now used for the executive offices of the Griffith Organization. 2. The studio, where all the interior scenes are taken. 3. The laboratory, in which the films are developed and printed. 4. An apparatus, consisting of two huge poles, connected by a cable, on which an aeroplane was hung so that close-up pictures could be taken showing the plane apparently in flight. This was used by Dorothy Gish in Flying Pat. 5. The lodge house at the entrance to the estate. 6. The set used for the outside views showing the home of Squire Bartlett in Way Down East. 7. The orchard, which supplies fruits for the studio restaurant. 8. The garden, where vegetables are grown for the same purpose. 9. The gardener's house. 10. The stables built for the Flagler family. 11. D.W. Griffith's house, fitted with private gymnasium, library, etc. 12. The trees under which the snowstorm scenes for Way Down East were taken. So terrific was the gale which was blowing when some of these scenes were taken that the trees under which Lillian Gish had to stand were fastened with heavy chains for fear that they would be broken by the wind and fall on her. 13. Mr. Griffith's private pier. 14. Summer House Built by Flagler The estate is on Long Island Sound, about two miles from the village of Mamaroneck, which is an hour's ride from New York City. Joan Does the Charleston by Dorothy Manners Picture Play, August 1926 to catch the attention of the noisy cash customers, the drummer of the orchestra, Montmartre's preferably, seizes his cymbals and ends the final chord with an abrupt, ear-rumbling crash. Master of Ceremonies, loud and funny. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of this evening's dancing contest is Miss Joan Crawford of the Metro Goldwyn Studios, dancing with Mr. In misplaced enthusiasm, a collegiate lets out a war whoop, and unfortunately, Mr. Blank's name is lost. It always is. Master of Ceremonies. Folks, maybe if we are nice, Miss Crawford will give us an exhibition. Maybe. What do you say? The entire horse-throated room. Yeah! At a crowd. Introducing Miss Crawford, who is going to do a little Charleston. A little aggravating Charleston for us. Let's go. The crowd jammed around the floor divides now. And there comes Joan. There she goes, all dressed up in her party clothes. Sometimes she wears white, with heavy gardenias on her shoulder. Sometimes green, pale pink, gray. Tonight it is black, studded with brilliance. Her long bobbed hair wavy and uncovered. With greedy eyes, the crowd perch themselves, like figures on a crazy freeze, around the smoke-befogged room, hungry lest they miss a step of it, of that tortuous in-and-out dance of the Negroes, the Charleston Charleston. 
Let's go! Somebody yells, There she goes! And no foolin', there she goes. Now her sleeves jiggle in the spotlight until the brilliance seem like wrinkling eyes suddenly gone crazy. Now her feet shuffle. Now her hands slide from knee to knee. The dance goes on. Somebody yells, Look at that lady! And if you look, you'd be crazy not to. You'll see a mock bit of rheumatism underway. Joan's white hands on a crippled hip. Now she shakes her hair into a tangle. Now her knees knock insanely. Oh my, look at that lady! An odd girl, Joan, and an awfully pretty one. Not unlike that little chorus girl dreamer that she played in Sally, Irene, and Mary. If you saw Irene, you know a little bit about Joan, the real Joan. She came from that atmosphere, stage doors, broken mirrors, broken everything, where whistling in a dressing room is on par with murder as an offense. One of the Metro Goldwyn officials spotted her in a spotlight and drew up a Klieg light contract with her. She packed her belongings, her mother and kid brother, and came out to the coast. Her name then was Lucille Lesseur. Too hard to pronounce. The Goldwyn people got up a contest that also got a lot of publicity and changed her name to Joan Crawford. Easier to pronounce. And before she made Sally, Irene, and Mary, she worked in a couple of pictures playing bits, or what did they have? Every night I see her in some cafe or another. She brought that New York suppertime restlessness to Hollywood. Always, she is the prettiest girl in the room. Between dances, she sits at a ringside table and sips straw-colored ginger ale out of a tall, chilled glass, and smiles politely at her escort. These gentlemen usually change with the evening, though lately she has been seen more than twice in the company of Michael Cudahy. So, of course, their engagement has been rumored. She used to dance a lot with a boy named Jerry Chrysler. You never saw such dancing as they did. Even in the jitteriest jazz, it was beautiful. They had a languid way of flowing from pose to pose. Jerry and Joan have ovations in Montmartre that would warm the hearts of the brightest Broadway favorites. The reason I mention it is because Jerry is awfully sick now and trying hard to get well out in the sunshine. People make inquiries about the dreamy-eyed girl with the jazz feet. Sometimes older couples speak to her, complimenting her on her dancing. She smiles at them graciously, thanking them for their compliments, her manner modest and unsmarty. They go back to their tables calling her a sweet girl. It is when she gets up to dance that she becomes different from the hundreds of other girls in the room. Like a priestess officiating at a rite. Saxophones, violins, the wailing voice of a coon singer caroling jazz philosophies. So much for that. On the screen, she has a nice quality of sweetness and depth. A reviewer on a local paper found her presence not unlike Pauline Fredericks. Not her technique, her presence. Out at Metro Goldwyn's, they are planning rather ambitious things for her. She is going to be featured in Paris, being made by Edmund Golding, the director of Sally, Irene, and Mary. You know what that ought to be. Clothes, 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 and fat men sending roses to thin girls. At least one champagne dinner. One true love, and a heavy with a mustache. A popular background. Joan, with her quality of sympathy, should fit nicely into it. Well, she'll make the picture, and at night, she'll drop into Montmartre and Charleston for the crowd. Maybe she'll wear blue, with a trailing soft feather on her hat. Maybe yellow. And people will ask who she is, and say she is pretty, and wonder if she is engaged to Michael Cudahy. The Chaplin Harris Divorce, a hitherto untold tale of the negotiations preceding the divorce, by permission of Brentanos. Photoplay, May 1924. In Frank Harris's Contemporary Portraits, copyrighted by Brentanos, there is an amusing and interesting new light thrown on the perennially fresh Charles Chaplin Mildred Harris divorce episode. Some of the tearful and conflicting statements issued by Miss Harris to the newspapers are recounted, and there is also given Mr. Chaplin's account of his telephone talks with her about the case. Under the caption of The Mildred Chaplin Comedy, Mr. Harris writes, 
Every morning in the paper, a fresh appeal appeared from Mildred Chaplin. The injured lady wept, protested, cajoled, threatened, all in a breath. One morning, a change. She published the following. My final statement. Mr. Chaplin is not a socialist. He is a great artist, a very serious personality, and a real intellectual. Yes, those are her very words, and she continues. The world will be amazed at the intensity of his mind. What can have happened, I ask myself. Has Charlie weakened and paid without counting? I read on. I have no desire to obtain half of his fortune. No? I will not hinder the sale of his latest moving picture. Whew, the wind sets in that quarter, does it? And then, I am entitled to a settlement. Eh? I am too ill, physically and mentally, to work at present, and this notoriety and exposition of my personal affairs is very disagreeable to me. Really? You needn't indulge in it, madam, unless you want to. Finally, he is a great artist, a brilliant man, plays the violin, cello, piano, and so forth. I have already filed papers against him. Well, well, and again, well. Here is Charlie's story of talks with his wife on the phone about their divorce. Is that you, Charlie? It's me, Mildred. I'm ill and have no money. Won't you give me $50,000 and settle all this disagreeable law business? You will? You're a dear. I knew a great artist like you couldn't be mean. If you knew how I hate to quarrel and dispute. Let us meet at my lawyer's in an hour, huh? Goodbye till then. Quarter of an hour later. Is that you, Charlie? Oh, I'm so sorry, but my lawyer won't let me take 50000 He says it's ridiculous. Won't you give me 100000 and I can satisfy him? Please, I'm so nervous and ill. You will? Oh, you, well, you're just you, the one man in the world. I can't say more. Now for that dreadful lawyer, and then we'll meet and just sign. How are you? Well, oh, I'm so glad. In half an hour, dear. Quarter of an hour later. Charlie, what can I say? I'm just heartbroken, and I have such a headache. That lawyer says I mustn't settle for a hundred thousand. His fee is goodness knows how much. I must have at least a hundred and fifty thousand. What am I to do? Mama says, you will? Oh my, I'm so glad. I don't know how to thank you. It's the last word you say? All right, Charlie, I'm satisfied. In half an hour then. Ten minutes later. It's no good, Charlie. I can't settle for that. It's really too little. You see, Charlie... Charlie? Did you ring off? Or is it the filthy exchange? Oh dear. Damn. Damn. Charlie Chaplin is a master of comedy in life, as he is on the stage. An artist in refined humor. He can laugh even at himself and his own emotions. On the point of leaving Pasadena for a trip to New York, he rang his wife up. Mildred, it's me, Charlie. Will you take half a million dollars and settle this ridiculous claim? You will? No, I'm not a darling, but meet me at my lawyer's in an hour and we can sign. Quarter of an hour later. Mildred, dear, I'm so sorry, but my lawyer won't let me give half a million. He says a year's earnings for a week's marriage is too much. He says a hundred thousand is more than generous. Will I listen to you? Of course I will. Talk away. A woman's voice, high-pitched. You're no man. Again, you've let me down and made a fool of me. You've no character. I'll teach you. Left talking. Charlie Chaplin strolls away from the phone with a smile on his lips and a little sub-acid contempt for human, and especially for feminine, nature. If you've soldiered on to the end of the video, then here's a bonus picture as your reward. I guess I'll make this a tradition for all of my collection videos. Alright, have a good day or night everyone, wherever you are.